So I'm going to put the slides on the screen. Uh, just a moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, for our presenter, we have Professor Jan Welsiner. Uh, he's a professor of cultural psychology at uh, Aalborg University. And this academic year, he's also working here at Tartu University Semiotics Department uh, as an expatriate Estonian visiting professor. Uh, Jan Welsiner is uh, one of the world's uh, leading cultural psychologists and in his research, uniting cultural psychology and semiotics uh, over uh, the last uh, two decades. Uh, as an alumnus of Tartu University from 1976, he has spent most of his lifetime in search for solutions to impossible to solve tasks, of which uh, the topic of allegories is a new addition. Uh, Professor uh, Walsiner also provided us with some complementary texts that uh, you can uh, find uh, on Simeo Salong's uh, Facebook uh, page linked there. So if you want to read afterwards, uh, there's some allegory going on. And uh, the link uh, will also be shared uh, in Zoom chat, I think. Uh, Professor Svalsiner's presentation uh, today in connection to uh, mythic analysis is about how allegorical sign fields set the stage for human dramas. So, please. Thank you, thank you. Oh, so you can... One, yeah. more, tech, one okay. more technological thing. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. All right. Probably this is easier. Or not. So thank you everybody for being here in person and also on the Zoom. It is more than heartwarming to follow up the previous presentation because it brings back to me as an Estonian uh, very much in transit all over the world some very specific aspects of allegorical making of Estonian-ness that you just saw in the previous presentation. All the three excerpts of Estonian poetry that you saw read and presented in parallel with English translations, were a remarkable and a nice introduction to my topic right today. Namely, all of them were deeply personal, either on behalf of the poet to oneself or in behalf of the character. They were deeply linked to his nature, as you saw in some of the topics, and all of them were none about it. They were all about the feeling Estonian, making Estonian language to be heard, becoming Estonian. And no surprise then that from generation to generation, Estonians who are singing to Koidula's poetry will have tears in their eyes. So in other sense, the allegorical startup from the first status of Estonian literature have had social function that has grown further in the Estonian minds over, over two centuries and basically keeps framing it even today, although we rarely think about it as our allegories actually are influential in our present world. So, huh? Which way? Okay, go this way. So the, the central notion that I want to talk about is the notion of silent sign fields. So there, in this sense, the three examples of Estonian poetry of the past would very nicely illustrate the silence in the sound. 
So they were all very voiceful, beautiful in their particular way of phrasing uh, and so on. But at the same time, they were nicely silent about the bigger picture that they were referring to. And this is, interestingly enough, very much a semiotic term, semiotic issue that we see in our most of the semiotic analysis, namely how to analyze affective atmospheres, affective atmospheres of here and now, affective atmospheres of a nation over time, affective atmosphere of a nation over 200 years out of which only a relatively short period the nation was independent at all. So in, in terms of semiotics, we have always concentrated on iconicity, indexicality, and symbolism. But actually what I want to do today is to say that this is somewhat trivial elaboration of, of uh, semiotics coming from Sartre's and the Spears. We, we can do better looking at Chers' other aspects. How do I do it? This is a, these are the two specific contributions I would consider I have brought to the field. The uh, left side there, you would see my basic uh, perspective on combining what I call schematization and pleromatization in the making of generalizations and hypergeneralizations. Schematization is a very simple notion that we know is very well from all of our cognitive science philosophy and even psychology, cognitive psychology, where, which means that we turn complex phenomena, complex experiences into categories uh, with which they then start to operate in our discourses. This is almost ordinary in our everyday lives. So the extraordinary aspect which goes in parallel and interconnected with it is what I call pleromatization. This is a notion of making a semiotic field, sign fields, that goes that are richer than the original experience. And it's exactly here where the notion of allegories becomes quite important. Not, not in the categorization side. The right-hand side is my elaboration of different ways of communication given our experiences. We, the main focus of it is a level four is that you see that the notion of hypergeneralization. In hypergeneralization, the particular feelings that before could be discussed in words at levels two or three vanish but remain at the same time highly functional or I would even say exactly as they are vanishing into the depth of our minds, they become more functional than our usual discourses in using language. So when we become deeply philosophically silent about ourselves, if our silence takes us over completely, then we have operating at level four, which we cannot speak about unless we translate it back to level two or level three. So this is a basic background from which I'm trying to approach the notion of allegories today. This is one of the very first that documented allegory, Giovanni Bellini's 1490 sacred allegory, which of course can be read at different levels. It can be read as a scene of nature with a, with a garden, but it has also been suggested it is actually a deeply allegorical take of the Garden of Eden and everything that goes with it. Of course, this interpretation is not from 1490. It is from the early 20th century. But it could be not a surprise to all of us that most of our hyper-generalized uh, communication happens through particular sign fields which are not interpretable in terms of particular elements that are there. Or, let us put it better, which are difficult to interpret by simply listing the elements in the whole. The whole dominates and the whole is itself uh, not in the picture but beyond the picture. So uh, this is one of the examples of this. So when, when we come to the overwhelming world of allegories, what do we see? We see all kinds of interesting pictures. For example, this is considered allegory of, of music. Uh, painted by Carl Gustav Carus, an early 19th century uh, medical doctor, psychologist, philosopher in Sachsen, in uh, Dresden, who almost came to Tartu University being offered a job as a gynecologist in 1814, but he turned it down and went to Dresden instead. So, uh, secondly, you will see 
a particular notion of allegory of fecundity by a court artist of Dirk Le Guade von Ravenstein of Rudolf II in Prague, so to say, you see different aspects of the paintings, all of which lead us to an interesting question, how are allegories made? What is a particular issue of allegories? <clears throat> First of all, there is a particular event, as you see in this general picture, which becomes interpreted in terms of a meanings which are generalized already. Meanings move into other meanings, A to B, and so on, and so on, and so on. At certain moment, from the already generalized meanings, there is a tendency towards, towards hyper-generalization that is leading to level four. And exactly at that moment when this is about to happen, particular lateral schematic insert is possible. And this lateral thematic insert is exactly the making of allegory in some direction. Something is declared to be allegory of something else. This, this making of an allegory may happen at the time when a particular painting is made by the painter oneself, explicitly or implicitly, but it can also happen even 200 years later when somebody who is reselling a particular painting decides to add the notion of its toy title with an allegorical implication or ex even explicit allegory so that it would sell better. Or in a particular painter, and in this case I'm working with the uh, court painters of the Rudolf II at the end of the 16th century, who would paint battle scenes of different kinds, most of which the uh, emperor actually lost or didn't win at least, but at the same time, no, nevertheless, the battle scenes were depicted by the artist, court artists, and they were, of course, meant to glorify the emperor. So you lose or win a particular event, the, your artist will always glorify you as a winner, which is quite important in our political life, even in our present day. Of course, many of the allegories were extremely, at that time in the 16th century and so on, were extremely overloaded by specific details. This is one of, one of these particular ones a, that was very widespread in terms of graphic lists. This is another one, filled with all kinds of graphic images, in enormous overload, as you may know from the Peter Bruegel, his tendency to put together all kinds of uh, children's games in one painting, and also in this case put uh, into place in Netherlands proverbs, also which were not identified more or less before 1950s, although the painting itself goes, uh, goes back to 1559. So it's a literally a con combination of a construction of allegorical statements about proverbs, which can be put into verbs, but they were not put, of course, by the artist. So in other sense, we, are, we have a constant flow of particular hyper-generalized uh, meaning systems in, in terms of uh, particular uh, sign fields, which are non-verbal in the presentation, for example, in paintings, uh, with paintings of collections like this, so paint glory paintings that you would see in the chapter I, I, I suggested in the, in the additional reading, so to say. At the same time, these are there creating the effective atmosphere for the people who are observing them, remembering them, or even forgetting them. So in the middle, in the very, very corner of you know, this particular remarkable painting, if you look into the very right-hand corner on the top up, you see, if you, if you try to analyze it, you see this. A particular man is depicting as creating one's excrement under the gallows, and the particular proverb dec decoded from Netherlands history is to crap on the gallows or to, uh, to uh, be undeterred of any penalty. And of course, there are 86 of these encoded in the big painting that you saw. So, how does the uh, production of allegories fit into semiotic dynamics, the perspective? I bring into cultural psychology and now here in Tartu also to semiotics. 
this is a very basic semiotic uh, system, big picture in irreversible time. My signature is that of the emphasis always on irreversibility of time, which this differentiates past, present, and future. In that process, particular sign becomes constructed on the, on the, for the present moment. And this sign may be also supported by different uh, particular personal memory systems as well as social representations in the society. And it starts to operate in, as a particular allegory in two ways. First of all, it does its own particular role here and now, that is for sure. But it, at the same time, it sets an indeterminate communicative message to the future. The as is becomes as uh, could or should be in the future. And there are two branches in the allegoric, allegory making that are quite crucial in this sense. One is anagogic ascent, which hypergeneralizes a particular life philosophical meaning, uh, going back to the uh, examples of Estonian poetry. All of the deeply personal lived through allegorical notions about Estonian nature and, and language are actually leading to the very one specific glorification of the native country, which at the time of the poets was not yet even there but we came to be there in the century later on. So no surprise that Christian Jak Petersen is not translated for 100 years. It was exactly the 100 years that would make it possible for the, his work to become, a, to reach a level where the allegorical nature of it would be relevant for the society. And at the same time, of course, there is a particular, what is called tropological guidance is the moral imperatives about relating with the world. So the allegorization leads to two directions, leads to hypergeneralization on the one hand, which maintains its function over time, over, over reversible time, and then it downwards to the, to the particular guidance of how to act on moral, in moral terms in one or another moments of encounter with the environment, so to say. So this is basically my little contribution to it. So this is the notion of. So and here you see a very interesting little pa painting, Parmigianino from 1533, which was tediously copied in, in, uh, by Josef Heinz in uh, Rudolf II era. And the interesting issue in, uh, here is that, is that you see the number of particular elements that uh, are in the background, but the relevance becomes quite important in the foreground. This is exactly the two children. Ah. This may be all that I wanted to say. It is all, I think. So thank you. And I am very open to all kinds of questions and commentaries. Uh, are there questions? Yes, just a moment. Professor, would you say that allegories are actually like products of imagination? Oh, of course, they start from a private imagination without any doubt but exactly as they start from the private imagination. I mean, think about imagination, uh, like uh, allegory, some, some, let's say, in some way twist, imagination also, some, in some, in, not in some way, completely twists the reality. So. Well, uh, well, here I disagree. Imagination doesn't twist the reality, but the imagination so sets the stage for the future encounters with the reality. Imagination is an absolutely central aspect of human psychological functioning because thanks to it, the person can, here and now, create an image, imagine, that one is not here and now but somewhere else. That particular imagination moves ahead of the person and very often leads the person to particular actions which may be totally irrational from the point of view of here and now but at the same time may lead to exactly the 
innovations that human beings are good known for. Can it twist the reality? Yes, it twists the reality, but the twisting of reality is a necessary aspect of growing over there, living, living on, rather than misfit with the reality. Yes, we are all misfitting the reality. Or if we did fit the reality as it is, there would be no development, personal development possible, no societal development possible, and basically we would live in a society of robots which can be only replicated in a robot factory. Okay, and do you think like this anticipating future can also be a, some sort of allegory because we're not certain about the future, we don't know. I mean, p future is a part of imagination too. Yes, of course, it's, it's part of our personal lives. We need the allegories, we use the allegories. It is part of the social life. We are given the allegories, the emperor is great, yeah? for example, in the case of the 16th century. Uh, we invent the gen hyper-generalist allegories ourselves collectively, so we are basically living with the help of the allegories, even if we don't notice them. And my point about the present-day life is that we seem to live in a highly rational world, which where decisions are made on the basis of calculating this and this and this and that. Yeah? But behind all that rational world is exactly the are exactly the tears of Estonians who sing the song of my Isaman in arm and cannot stop crying. This is not rational, but it is very deeply felt into the particular societal structure, starting from Lydia Goidula in this sense. Without Goidula, the song would not exist. That comes from her personal feeling into the particular situation she was in at the time. Now, after Goidula, every reader, reciter, would, would have uh, fit into that particular recitation one's own personal feeling system and the tears that come with it. And finally, the big song festival that presents a song in the same text will guarantee the collective, uh, collective uh, relevance of the, of the allegory put into practice, not to speak of the singing revolution, which is an Estonian characteristic which I don't think any other country has ever changed the political power by six hours of singing. So to say. Questions? Uh, maybe I have one. Um, how would you uh, say uh, this approach or understanding this uh, dynamics is relevant for uh, psychology today? Uh, it's very difficult to generalize about psychology today because it comes in so many different directions, parts, based on so many different axiomatic assumptions. For example, the axiomatic assumptions of cultural psychology are completely different from those of cognitive psychology and so on. But at the, if we try to answer that question, I think the critical issue in psychology is, comes actually following your question before. That is the role, how we understand the notion of imagination in the totality of the structure of the psychological or functioning. In the traditional psychology, imagination has been a kind of imp impossible to ignore, but somewhat uncomfortable phenomenon. Namely, this is m messing up our efforts to be rational. Our imagination can twist the reality, as you pointed out, it can create a totally uh, unrealistic reality, so to say, it can make us mad we may become mad poets, as was said before, whatever. So that's a traditional way of separating imagination from, from the, uh, the psychological system, of trying to push it to the side. Whereas what we are, we are bringing in here in this cultural psychology of dynamic semiosis, basically, is the centrality of imagination. We live forward into the future. And the only way we can live forward into the future in the next step is to imagine what would happen at the next step. And if we imagine that, we may be right or wrong, I mean, the next step may give us totally different aspects than we imagined at the given moment. But the act of this kind of imagining leads into 
further living and further. And that is a contribution that could bring psychology close to the reality which it is sometimes is losing. Thank you. Are there questions in uh, Zoom mm -hmm. from people in Zoom? Hello? Yes, please speak. Hi. Thank you for your excellent talk, Professor Balsner. You characterized your talk as a divergence from semiotic. You said icon index symbol are inadequate. And for the most part, I agree with you. They're a bit underdeveloped and we can go much farther than that. Nevertheless, uh, your analysis of painting reminded me quite a bit of, for example, uh, Frederick Stierenfeld's Percy and diagrammatic analysis of painting and diagrammatology. I know you're familiar with, with Frederick's work. Also, the uh, description of the function of time here, this retrospective uh, redefinition of the meanings of the paintings according to cultural, changing cultural context, remind me very much of Yuri Lotman. So do you have anything to say about that? Okay. Well, there are obvious connections of my work with Yuri Lotman, there's no doubt about it. I borrow very many important ideas from Lotman and modify others. So that is quite clear. Now, when it comes to the question of retrospectiveness, I, I would not say that. I would say that the ma making of the signs is a prospective and not retrospective act. It can become analyzable retrospectively, of course. That is the moment of the irreversible time when the sign operates. It not, cannot be captured that's the same, reflexively as it, it would be. So it's in this sense, yes. So, yes, of course, I'm build, trying to build on Lotman in different ways, uh, ways that actually move a little bit away from Lotman, as uh, people in my seminary in Tartu have had a possibility to uh, observe. Uh, so, uh, 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 yeah. What, what about Frederick's? What about Frederick Schoenfeld's work on diagrammatic analysis of paintings in diagrammatology? I wouldn't. Somehow I wouldn't. Maybe there are two computers that makes it. Uh, maybe one should. One. Uh, the, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, he is there, but uh, I, I don't clearly hear the question. Uh, could you repeat I'll, the question? Yeah, I'll repeat Taylor. once more. I know you're familiar with Professor Stiernfeld at Alborg University, and I was wondering if you're familiar with his work, his diagrammatic analysis of paintings, that is, iconistic analysis of, of classical paintings like Christ and the Levitating Cross, for example. No, I have not looked into it. This is oh. not, I haven't yet reached them. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions from people uh, participating online? You're very, I, very I, welcome to uh, speak up. I have one question. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes, now I can hear you. Okay, so my question is, uh, uh, at which point uh, can allegory or this allegorical insertion turns into ideology and into mythology in the sense that Barthes speaks of mythology or, or whether it does at all or, or, or are you thinking of something else? <laughs> uh, no, so basically my question would be... That is missing in my what I presented but it's a very good follow-up and exactly something that needs to be answered. So almost certainly the particular allegorization that happens either by personal hypergeneralization or by insertion, as you point out, it moves into the making of the myth, 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 poetical, myth poetic realm of the existence of the person in society. Now, a certain aspects of those, under some circumstances, will be turned into ideologies and very strong ideologies in many ways. And of course, the effective starting point that comes from through generalization of affect, pleuromatic generalization, and then hypergeneralization of affect on behalf of the persons makes this idealization possible. And this is quite important in our present day world exactly to see the, how the threshold from 
Mr. Poetical field to the ideological field is transcended. What could stop it from moving this way? Because our world is filled with growing new ideological uses of human beings so deeply dedicated to the ideologies that they lose any uniqueness of themselves thinking beyond the ideologies. You see, you saw that in the history of human beings, human societies. You see it nowadays with very clearly with the issues of the Islamic dedication to creating a new emirate in the Syria, which failed, of course. All of these are examples of this ideological overdetermination of human lives, which are very, very challenging to almost anybody in any society. So uh, work on this kind of, on that threshold that you bring in is exactly very important. Anyone else has a question? We have some time for a discussion, so also comments and mind wanderings are really welcome. Sure, just a moment. What do you mean imagination can make us mad? I mean, imagination in psychology is like a defense mechanism. Well, any defense can make us mad if we take it sufficiently far. So to say, it depends how you defend, what you defend, where you defend. So uh, my mo notion of linking it with leave example from before is exactly that the particular hyper-generalized aspects of human being that you, you see me advocating have their potential darker side, which can occur, but usually do not occur in us. The notion of ideological dedication that we were just discussing here is one step before or the side of it, maybe. Hopefully not before, but the side of it. Would you, would you consider a totally dedicated ideological fighter for something who can kill anybody on the way? Would you consider this a madman? He's not a mad poet, obviously. He's a mad killer. So, or does the adding of the notion of mad to that particular phenomenon change anything in the phenomenon? I don't know. Imagination, imagination needs to be trained uh, not to be dangerous. I mean, I know that in, from experience. Well, good. If, uh, but it can also become dangerous. Just two observations. One is your description in the scheme that you showed actually mirrors the Marx and Engels Communist Manifesto very well, the past. <laughs> the past uh, experience of exploitation <laughs> and the development of a uh, utopian uh, ideology, no? Mm -hmm. And the second one is, uh, comment is where does, I mean, in all the examples that you made from contemporary history or contemporary uh, political situation, where does the uh, allegory come in? I mean, in what a role does it play? Is it so constitutive in your system that uh, we must search for it? Or where is it? Implicitly or explicitly? Uh, well, I cannot, of course, compete with Marx in, in this sense, and I will not try to do that. The second question of where are the allegories in the present day ideological systems? Well, they are somewhere in the invisible. That was a point I started to make from the beginning, but they are very powerful. Searching for the promised land, going as an Islamic convert from Scandinavia to, to Syria, only to find the civil war position, is not very different from the 1490 uh, allegory of the uh, Garden of Eden that you saw in Berlin. That's basically the making of a particular background field demand or field orientation, searching for the 
promised homeland, uh, searching for their homeland in general. That is actually the, if we, if we start to analyze the tears of the singers of Estonian national songs in this song festival, this is also a part built on a particular underlying uh, allegorical field of a Isama being existent as an ideal story, rather than a piece of land which is bordered on political maps, so to say. Uh, the making of a particular, any particular new idea, for example, new idea in psychology, would be somehow flavored in some kind of hyper-generalized field kind of supporting the move in this direction rather than another direction. It's not the obligatory direction that we're talking about. So the, my starting point was exactly that the alleg allegories exist in our background today, but they are hidden. They are almost invisible, although they come vis become visible in particular directions of interpretation of otherwise very mundane little aspects, so to say. And this is an interesting part which needs to be inquired. I do not have any answers here. I will check if there are any questions in the chat. There are currently none. I, I have one more comment. Can I? <laughs> Israel, we cannot uh, hear you at the moment. Uh, uh, what about now? Is it better? Yes. Yes, okay. Good. So um, it's just one comment, but uh, because it seems to me that what is being discussed now, it has to do with uh, uh, what I would like to call it like uh, the upper threshold of semiotics. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. I think this uh, very closely, closely relates to uh, uh, Tyler's uh, dissertation and, and some ideas he has been sort of advancing regarding uh, Tardo signs, which uh, have to do, if I understand what he says uh, correctly, with this sort of invisible sign fields that they are just so automatic. Uh, and, and this has like, to me, it seems that this is a, a very uh, a, a contemporary uh, um, preoccupation in semiotics because I, th I, I think uh, Antti Randvir has also been working in, in, in similar things, uh, also from, from our department. So, yeah, well, just, uh, I just wanted to make that comment, uh, you know, like sort of bring, bring echo here and then say that to me, it, it seems that this is the sort of discussion about the upper threshold of semiotics, which is not so often discussed, but uh, it's also quite important. And yeah, <laughs> thanks. I think you are, you are right. I think um, it is in the upper part of the semiotics for sure. And uh, indeed, any particular effort, intellectual effort, to try to make sense of this field-like phenomena in semiotics, especially field dynamics in the flow of the meaning uh, backgrounds of ours. This, I think any of these efforts would, would uh, belong to a similar category. Yeah? Uh, there is a hand up uh, in Zoom, so please, Transglobalist Time Machine, you can speak up. Oops, I'm sorry, I forgot to change the account. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, well, I uh, want to say that uh, I think it's very interesting, this kind of analysis about, uh, in this case, uh, the examples of fine arts that you just exposed. And uh, I think uh, it is a very critical point to worry about those kind of analysis because of, uh, I would say the crisis we are living nowadays in uh, culture, spectacles, fine arts, it's like, we could say that uh, fine arts are uh, getting less important here on America. I am from Mexico. And so I find very interesting this kind of analysis because this kind of uh, makes a little bit of justice on uh, 
fine arts. And my questions for you, Master, will be the following. Is there any circle of uh, scientists who are uh, encouraging this kind of analysis besides you, to whom I can refer and so I can uh, access to this uh, scientific material of analysis? The first one and the second one will be uh, what do you think that uh, will be the next path to develop this kind of uh, scientific analysis? I mean, taking into account that uh, it is a very critical point in the history, right? To precisely expose this kind of uh, value in fine arts. And well, that will be it. And uh, thank you in advance for your answer. Cheers to all from Mexico. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Well, uh, Easter had already mentioned a few scholars here in Tartu who are de dealing with similar issues. I am a relative newcomer to that level of high level of semiotic effort. So I came to it more or less by coincidence because in my own building of the theory of the dynamic semiosis, I could not in that a certain moment ignore the ways how hypergeneralized uh, meaning value systems or science systems are organized. And there came the question of allegory. And from there came the allegory came actually looking into the Renaissance uh, discourses in around Rudolf II because all of the interaction at this time for anybody who was be, whose interaction we can remember or know now was based on allegories rather than ended in allegories. So the allegories, allegorization was complete and explicit. Whereas in nowadays as our discussion comes out, allegorization is becoming implicit. Now, what could be a next step on how to analyze this scientifically and what is scientific in this kind of looking into the clouds of science fields? This is an interesting and very difficult question because in some sense, the phenomena here defy both psychological sciences traditional repertoire as well as semiotics traditional repertoire. They are very dynamic. They are hyper generalized. They are hidden from our immediate uh, uh, retrospe re retrospection, prospection, and so on. And at the same time, they are existing as we feel ourselves in our everyday life. So at a certain moment, we just start to cry because of a particular poem, which happens to be that of an Isramaya. So, uh, so all of this needs a totally new uh, way of looking at the scientific uh, termi terminology and scientific analytic tools, which semiotics could be very close to, but I don't think it is completely there because uh, question of turning semiotics into a dynamic and developmentally oriented science is yet to happen, in my understanding at least. So I think that you can do it, or you, you personally as well as people in the audience, if you're interested in it. I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for your answer. I think it's very clear and uh, I surely will contact you in the meantime. And uh, well, thank you all. And I just would like to add that uh, well, I'm a creator too. And uh, in my experience, uh, madness is kind of a part of the process of creating, you know, and uh, yeah, it's true. We need to train our imagination because it can be very dangerous too. Once uh, you get into it, you can create parallel worlds and uh, the creator is still human, but uh, it's uh, already making human things, right? So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. So, if there are no more questions, 
then thank you everyone uh, thank you. for being here and there and everywhere and i would uh, really want to thank uh, israel as well who is in mexico currently and couldn't uh, be here unfortunately but uh, he would like to uh, say uh, some final words to you. So, Israel, please. Yes, <laughs> thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I would just uh, really, really like to uh, thank all of you, uh, especially Ellie. Uh, I, I really thank you because uh, especially this last session, uh, it was mostly you. So thanks a lot. And. Uh, yeah, I also really, really want to thank uh, Tyler and Ludmila and Palaski University and uh, yeah for all the support uh, because really it was uh, uh, it's very much appreciated and uh, yeah I, I just uh, I want to thank everybody I I, I guess if, if I go name by name I will uh, certainly leave someone. Uh, outside and i wouldn't like to do that but uh, everyone that uh, has been involved in this uh, 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 the well in this uh, semester series uh, yeah th thanks a lot to to all of you that have been here and to all the presenters which uh, sadly i think not all of them uh, can't be here uh, could be here but uh, well and uh, yeah so i guess um, i would only add that uh, we will have a, a, a new session next semester. <laughs> I mean, a new series uh, next semester. And uh, I can only uh, like uh, advance, or, or I can only say that uh, it, will, it will be about uh, general semiotics in a way. So uh, expect quite, uh, quite, quite, quite broad selection of topics. And uh, hopefully we will have uh, some nice guests from uh, uh, other universities, maybe in uh, from Lithuania and uh, or from Czech Republic, uh, uh, yes, and uh, uh, just uh, uh, stay uh, in tune uh, in the Facebook page, and, and we will uh, uh, update uh, update everything there. And uh, yes, so thanks a lot because uh, this has been, I think, the second uh, most long <laughs> uh, series with with uh, these five. Uh, presentations. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, and again, uh, thanks to Ellie and to Tyler and Ludmila and, and yeah, all of you and the presenters, of course, and the audience, because without you, we wouldn't, uh, yeah. <laughs> and thank you, Israel. Thank you, Israel. <laughs> oh, th th thanks. Also, thanks to Kalibi and, <laughs> and, and to Amelia. Yeah. You, 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 you are also always here, so yeah, <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, very good. And uh, yeah, so see you next year. And uh, uh, I, I send very warm greetings to all of you in, in Tartu and in Europe. Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry that you are going through this minus 20 degrees there in Estonia, <laughs> because here in Mexico is like 35 or something, so. <laughs> <laughs> but well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you again. And see you next Thank year. You. Have a good day.